Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 752 for November 26, 2022. And I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Bart Bouchatz, Programming by Stealth, installment 141. What's on our schedule for today, Bart? Well, it's part two of our mermaid discussion. So, well, actually, no, it's part one of our mermaid discussion. It's part two of our UML class diagrams discussion. So last time we learned about why we care about such things, which is, you know, that's the no cast way, right? Start with the problem to be solved. And then we went on to look at the, do you call it a syntax if it's a description of pictures? I don't know how we... The rules for a UML uh, diagram? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, maybe rules. Yeah, it's syntax too, though. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is syntax. Uh, and then I left you on a teaser, which is, oh yeah, and by the way, these diagrams are made from a text-based markup language, which means we can keep it in version control and stuff. And that markup language is our topic for today, and that is a language called Mermaid, which is inspired by <laughs> Markdown, but for diagrams. Yeah, so is is Mermaid the only way to create text based uh, mark or UML diagrams, or just the one that we're going to use? It is the only text based one I'm aware of. Okay. Um, there are other like the if you pay a lot of money for a development tool, these particularly exist for the the more corporate languages like Java. Uh, so there are tools where you can just throw like five thousand, no, not like hundreds of thousands of lines of code at the tool. And it will read the code and pull out the diagram for you. Wow. Which wow. is, yeah, I mean, they're high-end corporate level tools, which is amazing if you're handed someone else's code to maintain. You just throw it into the analyzer and then you go, oh, thank goodness I can look at a picture. <laughs> <laughs> so here's something Here's something funny. Uh, during Thanksgiving dinner, we uh, our buddy Ron was here for Thanksgiving down in uh, San Diego. And uh, I told him what we were doing in Programming by Stealth. And I mentioned UML class diagrams. And he goes, oh, God, those things are great. We loved using those. He's a systems engineer uh, doing space-based uh, uh, satellites. Oh, wow. I guess that's the only kind of space uh, satellites there are. But yeah, satellite communications. Uh, and he was like a huge fan. He said the big thing that they gave you was... If you create them and you create any uh, a widow and, or an, off, an orphan you can't go forward. So it finds the widows and orphans that maybe if you were just using text to describe a, a system right. and your system's requirements or, or a function, you could create those and you wouldn't know that you created them. And so you literally cannot pass go unless you close all the all those uh, connections. Well, that's very clever. Yeah, I mean, so he's are, a huge fan. They are very powerful, um, both visually and because a lot of times they're machine interpretable as well. So yeah, they're, they're a fantastic tool. Uh, now, so Mermaid is going to be our tool of choice for making our UML diagrams. And Mermaid is actually more than just UML. So Mermaid is actually a diagramming tool in general. They have their website lists all the different types of diagram they currently support. And I guess at any point in time, they could add more types of diagram. Um, I think well, that's true of any diagramming tool, because I went out looking for a GUI-based UML diagramming app. And basically what I found was diagramming apps that can also make UML. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would have in the past used things like OmniGraffle to do my UML diagrams. Uh, yeah, Visio makes them. Uh, Draw.io, my favorite drawing uh, diagramming tool does. Uh, actually, diagrams.net is what it's called now. Um, just tons and tons of them. Yeah. So Mermaid is, is our choice, and it is a JavaScript API that takes these text-based descriptions of diagrams and converts them into images. And like I say, UML class diagrams is one of its tricks, but uh, just looking at the docs here, it can do flowcharts, it can do sequence diagrams, it can do state diagrams, EOR diagrams, whatever a user journey is. Uh, it can do Gantt charts, pie charts, a requirement diagram, which I've never even heard of. A particularly useful one is actually a Git graph. So you know the way if you go to Git, or if you buy a book on Git, they have these lovely diagrams with circles representing the commits and lines connecting it all together when they describe, like, what does it mean to make a branch? Well, yeah. I instantly recognize the style of all of the stuff on Git ho on, on the Git homepage. It looks like the Git graphs made with uh, Mermaid. So maybe, may either Mermaid is copying off the Git book or Git are using Mermaid. I'm not sure which, but either way, <laughs> very useful. Something called a C4 diagram, which I don't know what that's about. And oh, mind mapping, Alison, although it has an exclamation point and a vest icon, which I think means under construction. 
Yeah, I did start going down the path of trying to use Mermaid for uh, flow diagrams, and it's a big pain in the backside. Doing it text-based, way harder than doing it in a GUI, dragging and dropping boxes. And so I'm curious to see whether this is a lot harder than you would think just drawing a box would be with some text fields in it. And well, I think and such. in this case, because you're sort of designing code, I think it probably makes sense to, to, to have it in a texty based format. And the same is probably true of some of the other UML style diagrams. Well, I'm guessing, I'm not sure I'd want to use it for a mind map. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But as I say, it, work, it works well for this. Um, so that is what we should be using it for. So you, it, they actually have a live interface because it's JavaScript based. It works in browsers, of course. Uh, so there's a link in the show notes to their live editor where you can just type in Mermaid and watch it in real time, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's also really good for debugging uh, if you're experimenting about. If just being able to put it into a live tool is so useful, especially while you're learning the syntax, like I was this time last week or two weeks ago. Oh yeah, and that really useful. Uh, I will say that as as of the date of recording, there is a bug in the live version that it can it it doesn't do the uh, cardinalities on relationships in class diagrams in the GUI or in the live oh, version. And that's kind of important. It's important for us, yeah. Which is, I thought I was doing it wrong, and then I ran it on the command line, and they came out fine. And then I put the identical code into the live one, and it didn't work. I was like, oh, okay, my code is right. Just a bug in the live one, so I should really get around to... It's all in GitHub. I should log a bug against that, actually. I should do that after we record. Do my, my little bit of civic duty for open source. Um, so, because it's JavaScript, it probably comes as no surprise that we could install it using NPM. And you can actually include it in your own code. So you can actually include the Mermaid code as a part of your own project. So if you were doing something like building an Electron app, you could get your diagrams for free using Mermaid like, and your pie charts and things. So that's potentially useful. But for our purposes, happily, the official Mermaid people also wrote a command line wrapper for their library so we can use it as a terminal command, which is, of course, what we're going to do. Because, hey, that's how I roll. <laughs> and you can also install the terminal command via good old npm. If you would like to play along at home, um, you can uh, download the zip file. It just contains the mermaid text files. To be honest, you can copy and paste them into text edit or whatever and save them as we go. It's <laughs> probably not much more work than using the download. But anyway, I figured I'd bundle them up for you since I had to write them anyway. Um, so, so there <laughs> it does are. make it easier to just splat in the, uh, the commands you've given since you've given us the files. That is true. So because we're getting this from uh, Node.js, uh, we need to make ourselves a folder to work in. Now, I would suggest just using the folder from the zip file to work in. So if you pop that open in the terminal, we then need to install the Mermaid CLI into that folder, which we can do with our good friend npm install. Yeah, I'm not sure the minus minus save is all that important. But anyway, it's just pure habit I put that in. Uh, and then the package is at mermaid-js forward slash mermaid-cli, which is definitely a copy and paste one. So you have to install that in every folder where you want to use mermaid? Yes, which generally okay. means, or realistically, you're going to be using it as part of a project. So you're actually just going to do an NPM install like you would any of your other dependencies. Okay. Yeah. But certainly for UML diagrams, it's going to be a part of a bigger piece of work. Um, Hypothetically, you can install a an NPM package globally, but the Mermaid people warn on their documentation site that there are strange bugs, I believe is the phrase they use, or something like <laughs> weird behavior, something like that, if you do it globally. So I figured, well, if they're warning not to, let's let's heed that. You know, it's always good to read the manual and then obey. So once we have it installed, we can exit. So the command line version of Mermaid is MMDC. And the easiest way to run a, an executable file installed with npm is with npx, which is node package execute. So we just, the command is, for us will be is this npx. MMDC, uh, before you read it out loud, I want to cement MMDC. Is this specifically class diagram? So we could memorize that as MM diagrams class? No, that is all of Mermaid. Oh. So Mermaid. All of Mermaid. Yeah. So I, I presume it's Mermaid Diagram Creator or something. That's how well, I have I'm going to remember brain. it the other way. 
I'm going to remember it the other way so I can remember it. <laughs> oh, look, whatever works. Way, okay. Whatever works. Okay, so it's MMDC. It's MMDC. So, and because we're doing it over NPM, we're going to do NPX MMDC. So as I say, there is a hello world example sitting in the folder. So our first thing will be NPX MMDC minus minus scale two minus I hello world dot MMD dot TXT minus O hello world dot PNG. And when you run that, it will make a file called hello world.png, which will contain two classes that will probably make you chuckle slightly, waffle and pancake. <laughs> okay, so so backing up, uh, the dash I am guessing is the input file. Correct. And, and you've got some name.mmd.txt, and I'm assuming mmd.txt, you're doing that just as a convention to help you remember that was a mermaid diagram? Yeah, I, yes, I could have just done that MMD, okay. but then nothing knows it's a plain text file. So I, I often do double barrel extensions like md.txt for markdown and stuff like that. Okay, so you did MMD for mermaid, mermaid. diagrams. Yeah. Okay, so that's, this could have been pancake.txt and it would yes. work. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't care about the file extension because the minus I, it will just go fetch whatever you give it with the minus I. So minus I for input, minus O for output. Okay, that's that's common, but what's the minus minus scale space two? So by default, it uses teeny tiny fonts that I don't like. Uh, so a scale factor of two means double everything. Okay. Um, your your mileage right. may vary. You may pref- you may want three. You may want zero point five if your eyesight's amazing. Uh, but I I like two. Two works for me. So if we look at that hello world file, we will see that it is a very simple piece of markup. It says class diagram v two. Class pancake, class waffle. And it makes two boxes, one called pancake and one called waffle. So that is a Actually, very... you should describe those two boxes to the audience because I'm looking at them, but they are not. Yes. So those are like we learned about last time. So your, your class in a UML class diagram is a box of three boxes, sort of three rows in a box. How did we describe it last time? So yeah, three rows in a box, I would say. Yeah, so the top row is where the name goes, the second row is where the attributes go, and the third row is where the functions go. Now, we haven't defined any attributes or any functions, so literally our boxes just have their names in the top section, or row or region. So the basic syntax is that you, you could actually have multiple diagrams in one file. So the basic syntax is you say the type of diagram you want, so in our case, class diagram v2, And then indented underneath that, you have everything inside your diagram. And then if you wanted a second diagram, you could have class diagram V2 again, and then it would make two diagrams. I'm not entirely sure how it would do, whether it would make two PNGs or not. To be honest, I haven't experimented because I don't don't see why I want two and one. But the docs all say you can have two and one. So there you go. So if you were doing uh, something that isn't a class diagram, you would start with or diagram for an entity relationship diagram or mind map for a mind map or whatever whatever type of mermaid diagram you want that goes first and okay all right after you've said what type of diagram you want then the rules are different for every kind of diagram so everything else we learned today is specific to class diagrams and if we were doing mind maps it will be different rules because again it doesn't make sense for them to be the same because they're completely different things so for us then, everything, once we're inside our class diagram, we, we start to list our things that we want in the diagram. And you list the classes and you can define those. And then the relationships are each a separate entry. So if you sort of think of it like you have an entry for each class and then you have an entry for each relationship is how I think of it. Okay, and that's inside the squirrely brackets, right? Well, inside the squirrely brackets go the details of the class. So effectively, the squirrely brackets allow you to make one thing go over multiple lines. So class pancake is one thing, but we're, we're spreading it over multiple lines because in theory, there'll be other stuff inside our pancake class and class waffle is the same. So this is a very stripped down version for, because it's a hello world. So it'll become a little bit more obvious when we start to pad these out a bit. And then okay, the, the okay re- that makes sense. Yeah, and then the relationships would just be separate entries. And the order doesn't matter because what actually happens when you make a picture is that all of the markup is read and it builds an internal representation of what you're describing 
And only when it's finished reading all of your input does it start to convert that internal representation into an output. So your order of things has no effect on the order of the output because it's just building well, up a model. that makes sense. But because you've got these different relationships, things are going up into other things and down into other things and and the relationships of how many how many gazintas and get us out is and all that of <laughs> how many how many uh, how many quarks there are in a in a uh, uh, nucleon things like that you've got you can't you can't have it be built sequentially exactly. it just it wouldn't make any sense precisely which is actually very liberating because you can put things in any order you want and it'll be fine which is nice so, you know. When you're used to programming where order matters, this is nice. Just throw it in and it's all good. <laughs> um, also, uh, for a, a long time, there was no such thing as comments inside a mermaid diagram, uh, but they have recently added them. So assuming you've downloaded a recent version, you can make a comment by starting a line with percent percent and then adding in your can comment. Can they please add that to JSON? Come on. Oh, please, please, please. Yes, that would be so useful to have that in JSON. <laughs> Okay, so let us look at our class diagram syntax. So we define each class by saying class space name of class space open curly brace hypothetically any content we want and then a closing curly brace on a line by itself. And it is important to have that space before the curly brace because otherwise Mermaid thinks that your class is called my class curly brace. It, this... Oh, okay. Okay, so no cuddling. No cuddling. Um, no cuddling with the mermaid. There, we'll remember it now. <laughs> there you go. And uh, the closing curly is again a thing by itself because it basically means no, no. I'm not. I'm not adding anything else to this class. I'm now done. Otherwise, it would see that as being a part of your relationship or something. It, it would get very confused. Okay. Okay. So the simplest thing to add to your class is an annotation. So remember last time we said that you can annotate your class with the word abstract. That's actually the only valid annotation for us. And the annotation... Yeah, I forget what an annotation is. So an annotation will show up in the name part of the box. It is a way of sort of... Think of it as a tag. Probably the easiest way. Okay. So we're tagging okay. this class as being abstract. Now, if we were working in other languages, oh. there will be other annotations possible. But in JavaScript, the only annotation possible is actually abstract because JavaScript doesn't have okay. So it's either abstract or it's not there at all. Correct in, in JavaScript. Case. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so yeah, so it's ang it's angle bracket angle wait, bracket. Wait, what do you mean in JavaScript? You mean in these classes? Uh, okay. In class diagrams. UML UML can do more than we're learning about. So we are learning a subset of the UML class diagram. Right. But we're learning UML class diagrams. Okay. We're well, not, this isn't JavaScript we're writing. Correct. So UML class diagrams can do more than we have learned. Yes. Because other languages can do more than JavaScript can. Okay, but you said it's, it's, only, it's either abstract or nothing at all in JavaScript. But we're yes. not writing in JavaScript. We're writing okay. in UML. If you are describing JavaScript classes with UML, then the only annotation possible is abstract. <laughs> If you're Got describing you. okay. Java classes, close. yeah, there we go. So if you're describing okay. Java classes, you could have other ones like interface, and there's there's loads of other ones in other languages. But in JavaScript, abstract or bust. Okay. So that's the easy part. Then we have to start adding our members to our class. So UML calls attributes and functions. It calls them all members. And our members actually have some of the rules in common, which is nice of it. And then the syntax is a bit different, but Let's start with what they have in common. So the marker for saying this is public is um, they're called visibility markers and plus <laughs> means public and minus means private. And again, if we Sensible. were working in other languages, there would actually be other possibilities because other languages have some, have visibility between public and private, but JavaScript has none of that. <laughs> so I would like a translucent indicator, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually protected is a very popular one, but JavaScript doesn't support it. So okay. those are plus or minus. And then the other mm -hmm. thing we can have is what's called a classifier. And the only classifier that comes into play for us at the moment is the dollar sign, which sig signifies static. So dollar okay. sign is static. So, so attributes and functions can both be static, static as, as a uh, classifier? Yes, they okay. can. Okay, so let's look at the attributes. So the syntax, it takes the form visibility marker, followed by type, space name, followed by classifier. And everything apart from the name is optional. 
and both the visibility marker and the classifier must be cuddled if they're present. So if you don't have a type, then the visibility marker juts against the name. The visibility marker can't be on its own. It has to be nudged into something. And the classifier has to be nudged into something. Think of them like magnets. Okay. So you clip one onto the front and you clip one onto the back. Okay. Okay. And whatever you've got in between, if you've got more than one thing, if you've got a type and a name, they've got a space between them. But if it's only a name, Just then clip it, all together. it would clip on both on both sides. And you yeah. can't have only a type. Yeah, that makes no you sense. You have to have a name. You have to have a name. Okay. Precisely. Yes. Okay. So uh, that's, that's a hard to say, but it actually makes a lot of sense when you see it written down. So if we look at a very silly example, we have class diagram V2 class my class then we open you know our uncuddled curly to open it up so the most basic thing we could have is an attribute called a most basic attribute it just has a name that's it okay we could say oh we'll make it a public basic attribute by saying plus a basic public attribute we could give it a type so we say minus string space a private string attribute or we could have like a type and a visibility and a static. So basically, plus date space a public static date attribute dollar. Okay. So the important thing of that last one is it's got a plus at the beginning, it's got a, a dollar at the end. So the plus tells us the visibility, the dollar is the static attribute um, uh, classifier, sorry. And then it's got date is the type, and this long name you've written out is just the name. Yes. It but could they've be got a waffles. space between them because they can't be up against each other. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I mean, it is sensible. By the way, this is much, it is much more sensible when you've just described it. There is great value in your description because I read it and I was like, what? Because these <laughs> names got really long as you were trying to be descriptive. Yeah. But I see what you're doing now. Okay. Yeah. And so if you run that through, uh, so NPX, MMDC, minus minus scale two, minus I, example one, minus O, example one, you will see how they look and they look just like the UML specification says they should, because, of course, Mermaid is doing all the heavy lifting. So the static stuff is underlined, and the rest of it is actually pretty much as you typed it. Okay. And it appears in the middle box because they're attributes, of course. So right, right. Move, moving on to functions then, the rules are not massively different, but there are more of them because functions can do more things. So again, the visibility marker goes in the front and has to be cuddled. Then we have to have a name. So the name is the only thing that's required. Sorry, the name and the parentheses are required because if you leave off the parentheses, it becomes an attribute definition. If it's just a name oh, and it's it doesn't own, know it's a function. Correct. So the name and the parentheses are required. Everything else is optional. So we have our optional visibility marker. And the parentheses marker. must be, hang on, the mm-hmm. parentheses must be cuddled to the name. They, the parentheses must be cuddled to the name, yes. Okay. And okay. so it's visibility marker cuddled to the name, then the parentheses cuddled to the name. If you would like, you can list your parameters, but you don't have to if you don't want to. And then if you want a classifier, you have to cuddle it to the end of the parentheses. And then if you want a return type, it's space and then the return type. Okay. So the simplest function definition is just my function opens open parens, close parens. Okay. And then all the rest is optional. And then the parameter list is comma separated, just like you were writing it in JavaScript. But you have the option to have either name, comma, name, or type, space, name, comma, type, space, name, comma, type, space, name. Now, in your uh, written thing, it says that the return type can be void, so it's not really optional. No, no, you can just not say it. But if you want to explicitly say nothing... Right. Not saying something is not the same thing as explicitly saying nothing, right? <laughs> yes. No, I should have said no. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, no, should. that isn't. Right. Um, <laughs> yes, you okay. So so if you wanna if you wanna explicitly say there's no return type, you can write void, but you don't have to write void, that's optional. Correct. So if you, if you want to okay. have your return types, if you're being really completist and you want to explicitly say this function returns nothing, then you give it the return type of void. Which okay. is quite a common um, practice in many languages. And then functions can no. have a second possible classifier. 
because a function can be abstract, and the classifier for that is a star. Okay. So if okay. you okay. Yeah. The, so, say, say again, what, what does a star mean? Abstract. Okay. All right. So uh, unlike in the um, generic members list, the classifier was always at the end, but that's not the case on functions, even yes. though functions are members. So that isn't something in common. Well, the, uh, the classifier is cuddled to the end of the name. I don't think, did I say in the text that it was always at the very end? I, I thought I changed well, my we, text. We, we verbally said it, so I, I would, that's why I wanted to draw attention to it. So um, the visibility is always, is always the starter, yeah. and, your, and your classifier is cuddled to the end of the name, but you may have other stuff after that, like void. Yes, or a, a, a normal return type like string or boolean or whatever. Yes. Okay. Mm. Wait, wait. So stri is string a classifier? No, no. Uh, the classifier what is, is dollar. So string would just be a return type. If you have a function that returns oh, a string. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yes. So again, we have our silly example class, class diagram v2, class my class. Oh, we don't can, read this out. Don't read it out, <laughs> right? It's basically a visual description of what I've just, or a visual example of what I've just said to, to illustrate the point. And when you generate the diagram, they end up in the lower box because that's where the functions go. And again, standard markup. Now, the official markup, by the way, has a colon separating the return type. So you'll notice that the diagram has its colon, but the markup language is space delimited, so it doesn't have its colons. Oh, interesting. Well, so you don't have to worry your pretty little heads about where those colons go. Precisely, because it's doing the hard work for you. You're just telling it what you want, and it knows it knows the rules, and it follows the rules. And so out comes your nice diagram. That would seem to eliminate a lot of errors. <laughs> oh, yeah. It does for me anyway, yeah, because I always forget. But, so, but get your spaces correct. If you, if you mess up your spaces, you're you're still doomed. Right, because basically what you're doing then is you're you're naming things weirdly because everything just becomes part of the name if you cuddle it all together. It just goes, oh, the name is you required. You probably notice. Yes. You probably notice because it would be, you know, uh, my, my, my class string. Oh, I lost you for a second, but I think you're back. Yep, we just, we just had a little hiccup. We're good. Your internet connection is unstable according to Zoom, but I think we're back. I think we're back. Okay, so... Next up then is our relationships. And so these are just a one-liner. So we have our class with its uncuddled curly brace down to its curly brace on its own, but our relationships are just going to be one-liners. One line, one line, one line, one line. And so the structure is the name of the two, the name of a class goes at the beginning and the name of, the of another class goes in the end. And then between the two, we have an ASCII art arrow of some shape. And if we would like, we can have cardinalities inside quotation marks. So class name, space, quotation marks with a cardinality, space, an arrow, space, cardinality, space, class name. And the cardinalities are optional. And are the cardinalities at the end where they would be drawn? So yes. if you say class one, uh, parenthesis, or sorry, quote two, that means the two is going to be sitting up next to the cl that class name. Yes, it is. And the second one is going to be near the near the second class. Okay. Yes. And when you're drawing the arrows, they're in a nice ASCII art. And you can actually draw them either way. So whatever way your brain likes, you can actually draw them either way and it'll be fine. Um, and yeah, so again, they're, they can be mirrored and they're ASCII art. So if you want inheritance, it's minus minus and then a pipe and a greater than sign. Yeah, it is a greater than sign. Yeah, yeah. Which looks kind of like a triangly sort of a shape, which is what the inheritance arrow is. <laughs> okay. The composition arrow is a filled in diamond, which is represented as minus minus star. And the aggregation okay. one is an empty diamond, which is represented as minus minus lowercase o. Okay. It bothers me that the arrows can go either way. <laughs> and they only go one way on the diagram. Oh, the diagram would be draw correct. them? But why not? Why wouldn't you draw them the way that they should look? Like you would, you would want it next to the one on the left, wouldn't well, the, you? 
Well, no. Okay, so if you prefer to write the parent class first, then you ro- draw your arrows with the head towards the parent. If you prefer to have the child class first, then you draw it with the head towards the second class. Oh, that's optional. Ah, so you could be looking at somebody's diagram, somebody's UML, and not know what it means. No, no, well, no, no. no, no, no. no. You, the diagram will look right. It's just if I look at their at their mermaid text, I won't know what it means. But it was no, no. It will look right. It would the ASCII art will mirror will be just like the diagram. It will be right. Okay, so let's say uh, Mike Price and me and Dorothy are all working on these class diagrams for xkpastwd.net, and I like the parent first, and Dorothy and Mike like the the child first. We're going to be fighting, drawing them, writing them differently in the same di- in the same exact document. Yes, at which point I'll come along and say, and the coding standard for this project is, and I'll toss a coin. <laughs> yeah, toss that coin early. Just just to let you know, because you know me, Mike, and Dorothy, we're just going to be all over each other. We're going to be up in each other's business on this. You do know, of course, that the way this usually works is people can't remember the syntax, so they just look up at the document. And so if I do it right once, you'll all do it by, without even thinking about it, you'll all copy it. Oh, aren't you adorable that you think we won't have opinions, Bart? <laughs> I just believe in human laziness. Sorry, economy of effort. Because no one remembers these syntaxes. And you could go look up the docs, but what do you do? You scroll up and you hope to goodness you find what you want when you scroll up, right? That's what I do all the time. I'm usually okay, copying so from myself, is, but, you know. The, parents, the parent is always near the tip of the arrow. The parent is at the tip of the arrow. And so whichever way okay. around you draw it, right. it'll work just fine. And it is ASCII art, so it's very, it's very markdown-like in the sense that it's this sort of ASCII art way of describing the relationships. So again, we can see the diagram for our atom from last time. I literally just took the, the atom from last time. And so you can see there in the example, we have our class nucleon, which we've marked as abstract. And then we can have our atom and our nucleon. And they have their cardinalities and their arrows. And now I remember the last thing I had meant to say which is that you don't even have to say class name of class. If you don't need to define anything about the class other than the relationships, just use it in a relationship and it will come into being. Because remember, it's building up the structure as you go. Uh, Okay, so when you say nucleon and you've got the arrow pointing towards it uh, and then say proton, nucleon just became a class? Nucleon just and became so a class, proton. and proton became a class, but I want nucleon to be abstract, so I have added a line that says class nucleon abstract. But I didn't add class atom. Oh, sorry, sorry. Right, you notice... Okay, and you didn't add class proton or neutron. Yes, because I have nothing to say about their content, so just adding them in a relationship is enough to make a blank class. Which is great. Okay. It, that's it, it's just building it up as it goes. And so that works exactly as you would expect. So that, that is, you know, that, that's it, to be honest, right? We now have our ASCII art, we have our syntax for everything. So everything we learned last time, we can now mark up in this texty language, and we run an MMDC command, and we get a diagram out. So now all I have to do is actually draw <laughs> the diagram for all of the classes for HSX Past WD. I mean, how hard can that be? That's, that's all you got to do. Yeah. You'll be really good at the syntax by the time you're done. That is very, or you'll have a hot true. mess, one or the other. <laughs> yeah, either is possible, right? But yeah, it'll be good practice. So I, I, I'll, I'll be very curious to see how I get on. Because that's going to be my first time using, like, what's the phrase, in anger? I mean, that's proper in, in anger, anger, you know. So yeah, we'll see next time how it looks. I imagine it will be I long. wish you the best of luck. Actually, I, I think a good, uh, we don't, you know, it bothers me when you don't give us homework because it doesn't, it doesn't cement. But if I was to do homework on my own, which I may or may not do, it would be without reading what you did, uh, not studying what you did to create the, the class diagram, the UML diagram for the atom, mm-hmm. would be to just look at last week's notes and try to, try to create it. That would be a really good thing to do, actually, yeah, because last week's notes describe the rules and then they right. show the picture, so can you replicate that in the code? Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect exercise, yeah. I know everybody hates me when I ask for homework for PBS, but I, I don't. I really don't learn it. It just goes in and right back out if I don't get to practice. If uh, if I don't get to type it a little bit myself, yeah, yeah that's a good point. Actually, I've, I've got. I'm so out of practice at this. I keep forgetting to do things like set you homework and stuff. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Well, I, this was a uh, definitely a short one, but uh, I could use a bite-sized uh, deal. This uh, my granddaughter's about to wake up, 
And when she wakes up, you will all hear it. Uh-huh. Well, it is Thanksgiving, so you're you're in holiday mood. You may have had too much turkey yesterday, so the brain may be functioning on half power. <laughs> yes, it was the turkey that caused that. Yeah, no, not not the um oh what is it you love to drink? Gin and tonics. Gin and tonics, not the gin and tonics. No, it was the turkey, definitely. <laughs> definitely. All righty. Uh, well, you and I will be chatting again tomorrow, uh, but the listeners will next hear us on this show in approximately two weeks, I hope. So until then, folks, happy computing. If you learn as much from BART each week as I do, I'd like you to go over to lets-talk.ie and press one of the buttons over there to help support him. He does 98% of the work here. I'm just the stooge that listens to him and asks the dumb questions. If you go over to lets-talk.ie, you can support him on Patreon, you can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of his referral links. I really hope you'll go over and help him out. In the meantime, you can contact me at Podfeet or check out all of the shows we do over there over at podfeet.com. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.